And welcome to Advantage Radio Ministries and welcome to Second Chances here at Lift FM. My name is Greg Hennis and this is our weekly radio program where we are honored to welcome guests from all over. I mean, they're literally from one coast to the other. Some uh, folks on the other side of the Atlantic, other side of the Pacific, uh, uh, Canada, all over creation. We've had uh, guests, the United Kingdom, but no matter who they are, what their story is or what they've been through or or where they're at currently, they all have a common bond, and that bond is Jesus. And Jesus is absolutely, positively the Lord of their lives. And our guest today, her name is Amy Lynn Nelson, and she is the author of the book entitled Behind the Mask. And Amy, as we begin this interview, we always like to start off all of our interviews, actually, by getting to know our guest a little bit, uh, uh, you know, about uh, where they're from, a um, little bit of their backstory, and uh, even sharing with us how they began their walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, and first off, thank you so much for having me on your show. Wonderful. Thank you. I it. Um, I am from Birmingham, Alabama, and I, um, what prompted me to write this book is, well, I'll go back a little bit further and tell you a little bit about where I came from. Um, I was raised in a middle-class neighborhood, um, mom and dad, four kids. I was the oldest of four, and we, my mom and dad were raised in church. We weren't. My dad, um, he believed that um, he was made to go to church every time the doors were open, so he wasn't going to make his kids do that. So we were out enjoying God's creation while everybody else was in church. And uh. so mom and dad were very protective over us. And they, they just, they felt like you know nothing bad would happen to us because they were so protective. And then you know I'm, I go into, um, yeah, I'm in high school and I get involved in a date rape type situation. And I talk about that in the book. And you know that that's just something that you, you don't really talk about. And um, but we, you know, we'll go into that in a minute. But um, um, I. I currently I have a daughter, and I actually have two grandchildren, and their their ages are nine and eight, and they're the loves of my life. And um, I decided to write this book. I actually wrote it 11 years ago, and I I didn't do anything with it. And then when all the controversy regarding Planned Parenthood came out within the past year, I decided that I wanted to let people know what happens to a woman after she has an abortion. And, that, and that's pretty much what my story is about, Behind the Mask, because I, I'm very transparent in the book, and I'll, um, I, I talk about the events leading up to the decision to have an abortion and then the events after I had an abortion. And, you know, I think that we've done a really good job, well, pretty, pretty good, about letting people know what abortion is, but I don't think we have done a good job of talking about what happens after a woman has an abortion, physically and emotionally. Mm. Well, obviously, uh, one of the things that you started off by talking about is uh, is the the title and, and why the title is that. But um, there's a line in the book that says, "No one who wears a mask wants to reveal who he is, for fear that their past will come back to life." You see such people in every crowd, in every church, in every social strata. Of life, um, talk to us a little bit more about that sentence right there. Well, when I, after um, I was involved in that date rape, um, that led to some sexual promiscuity, which uh, which ended up with me being pregnant in at the age of eighteen, to the point where you know I was you know needing to make the decision of whether or not I was going to have an abortion. I mean, at that point in my life, I'd never even heard the word abortion until somebody says, you need to have an abortion. And I said, what's that? And so, you know, during that time, or after I had the abortion, I began, I put on a mask. And, and, and what I wanted to portray to the rest of the world is that I was still a good person. I was, I was not an evil person because of what I had done. I had had an abortion because... Uh, Inevitably, every every person, I'm not going to say every person, the majority of people who have an abortion, who have conscience, who have an abortion, 
um, do have a lot of shame. They have a lot of guilt and everything. So, you know, what a lot of people do when they have hurts in their past, and it's not just with abortion, it's sexual abuse, I mean, anything. Um, you know, they'll put on a mask to show people, you know, that they've got everything under control, everything's good, everything's, you know, going on. But behind the mask, they're in turmoil, constant turmoil on the inside, a lot of hurt. And and that's what, you know, they just, like me, I felt like, you know, I was just ugly on the inside. And I did not want to share that part of me with anybody. And, and because of that, I held people at an arm's length distance. And I, I, I rarely let anybody come into my world because I didn't want them. I didn't, first, I didn't want to share that I'd had an abortion. Secondly, I didn't, you know, I, didn't, I was afraid to open up and I was afraid to be vulnerable and let someone know that I had killed my child. Mm. We're visiting with Amy Lynn Nelson. The book is entitled Behind the Mask. Uh, Amy, you, you alluded to a minute ago that um, date rape was it was uh, something that you experienced, and then later on you began to uh, live a life of, uh, 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 you know, uh, living in the world and, and just doing different things. But um, would you say that that date rape probably led to a series of events that it basically said, it set you down a, a, a wrong path at that time? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And because before then, I had a, a good circle of, of good friends. Um, even though I didn't go to church, I did play on a church softball team and was surrounded by a, a group of wonderful Christian girls. And um, and I had good neighbors and friends in my neighborhood to play with and um, and do things with. And then after that, you know, I, I felt I felt dirty. And, you know, in, in our home, whenever a cuss word or some kind of sexual innuendo or something came on TV, you know, my dad said, change that channel, I'm not watching that. And so, you know, the channel was changed. And, um, you know, and I, I felt, and, you know, he would call it trash. And so I felt like I was trash after, you know, I had been involved in that date rape. And so I needed to bring people into my world that could relate to me and you know my feelings my my negative feelings at that point and so I began hanging around a bad group of kids you know smoking cigarettes drinking alcohol and things like that and you know then it just it just it was a it was a downward spiral it was and then you know I had the abortion and and it just it from the time my from the time I was 16 years old until I was 25 years old, my life was a nightmare from hell. Um, when I was 25, that is when I became a Christian. Amen. And that is when um, I had a lady who, I, I mean, I would just, I would push people away. You know, I would, I would, I would see people that just, like my ex-mother-in-law, she just had this glow about her, and I could tell she was a Christian, so I just, you know, pushed her away. Well, this lady that I worked with, she was one of these people who just had this beautiful glow about her. And I thought, yeah, just as sure. She kept wanting me to go to lunch with her, and I thought, yeah, just as sure as she does, she's going to start preaching at me. <laughs> and so I, I went and go to lunch with her. So she showed up one day with some girls I'd been going to lunch with, and sure enough, she started preaching at me. I said, look, lady, get out of my face. I don't want to hear it. And I'm so grateful that she was as stubborn as me <laughs> because she started sharing how she had um, she had been married to um, her husband. He had um, tried to kill her on several occasions. She had six kids, and she finally got out of that marriage and married a wonderful, godly man. He adopted all six of her children. I said, Barbara, how in the world did you get out of that? And she said, that's what I've been trying to tell you. It was, it was God. And I thought, well, if God can do that for her, I want to know what he can do for me. <laughs> I, I was very selfish at that point in my life. But um, every day we would go across the street to this little hole-in-the-wall diner, and we would sit down. We would have a cup of vegetable soup, a piece of cornbread, and a glass of sweet tea. She would open her Bible, and she would share God's Word with me every day for six months before I asked Jesus to be the Lord and Master of my life. Mm. 
Now, obviously, you mentioned, uh, you know, the home you were in and st- different things. Um, mm-hmm. Did you ever discuss the the date rape issue with your, your dad and, and uh, your family? And how did they react to the fact that uh, you were pregnant and uh, had an abortion? Well, I did not share with them that I had, you know, been involved in a date rape because I was I was afraid. I was, you know, just walking in a pit of shame and I was so ashamed to let them know that I had had sex and and it it just it and then when I had the abortion I didn't let them know I had had an abortion until I went into full-time ministry ministering to women who'd had abortions because I knew and which was like 11 years later because I knew that I would be speaking in churches all over the place, and and I knew, and my you know we my mom and dad know everybody, and I did not want them to hear that from someone else. I wanted them to hear it from me, and so that is when I shared with them, and and Mama said, I wish you'd come and and told told us, because you know if I had, I would have never had an abortion, and and you know for whoever is listening to me today. I would like if you're pregnant and you're contemplating having an abortion, go talk with your parents. If you're a young teenager, go talk with your parents. And 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 also too, the child that is with inside of you, it already has a name. It already has an identity. You know, in Psalm 139, God says, "I knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb." And God knows your child, and he already has given it a name. And so I would like to encourage you to pray for a name for your child. There was um, a few years back, one of my friends called me, and she said, Hey, Amy, I've got a young lady sitting here at my kitchen table who is who wants to have an abortion. Come over here and talk to her. So I got over there, and we talked, and, and you know, and I, I said what I just said, you know, about, you know, the name and um, praying about a name, and she was afraid to tell her parents, and so I encouraged her to tell her parents. Well, She didn't have an abortion, and she ended up, she and her, um, the father of the children, they needed to just talk things out. They ended up getting married, and they had twins. Amen. How cool is that? (laughs) But um, I really really believe that when a woman has an abortion, um, it opens up the door for a foothold for the devil to come into your life and torment you as much as he can. Like with me, from from the time I can remember what sin was, even before then, and I didn't even know what the devil was or did or whatever, the devil taunted me with the thoughts of killing my child on almost a daily basis. And then I went through an abortion recovery group, and God did so much healing in my heart. And, and, you know, a friend of mine recommended that I go through the abortion recovery group. And, you know, I, I was hesitant to go through it because I thought, you know, what is this going to do? You know, I had an abortion when I was 18. Here I am, 31 years old. And But um, there was one part in the group where they brought out these two posters. And on one poster was a dead-looking tree. And on the tree, the, the roots were abuse shame, um, unforgiveness, and, and the fruits were, um, you know, guilt, rejection, fear, anger, bitterness, I mean, all kinds of negative things. And then on the other tree, it had roots of love, acceptance, and worth, and then the fruits of that tree were the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians five twenty two and 23. And I got to looking at that dead tree, and I thought, geez, that is my life. That is the kind of fruit that I bear. And And then, um, you know, they brought out, uh, a couple of weeks later, they brought out an embryonic development chart. Uh, And and I was 16 weeks along when I had my abortion. And when I saw my child on that chart, the development at 16 weeks, my child had a head, it had arms, legs, fingers, toes, it had a heartbeat. I was crushed. I was completely crushed because... Yeah, you know, I thought, what kind of a barbarian am I? But you know, when 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 I went to Planned Parenthood, 
to get the abortion, you know, the counselors there, they, you know, I had my abortion a long time ago, but they, unfortunately, they still use the same tactics, they use the same lines, and it doesn't change. I mean, I've worked with women who've had an abortion very recently, and, you know, they said the same thing. Planned Parenthood, they told me, what is inside you is just a mass of tissue. It's not a baby. It doesn't become a baby until right before it's born. And so, you know, that's exactly what an 18-year-old girl who's scared and pregnant wants to hear. And they know that. They do. So, um, you know, and they'd say, your life will be back to normal tomorrow. So I ended up um, not being able to have my abortion there because I was too far along. Well, they sent me to a local hospital. Well, I was in the hospital room, or the uh, they were doing an ultrasound on me. And I didn't know what an ultrasound was at that time. But they were doing an ultrasound on me, and there were two doctors looking at the screen. And, you know, I asked them, I said, what are you all looking at? And they turned the screen further from my view so there's no way I could see it. And, you know, I, I've, I've often wondered, what if I had seen my baby on that screen that day? You know, would I have had an abortion? I, mm. I don't think I would. Mm. I don't think I would. What would you say, uh, Amy, the extent your choice of friends contributed to your uh, vulnerability to become, you know, sexually involved uh, as, as the sta- downward spiral continued? A lot, a lot, because um, I wasn't really, I didn't really know what sex was. I mean, even though it was forced on me, I really, I didn't know what it was. I know that sounds crazy, but we were very protected in our home. And, you know, if mom and, if mom and dad ever talked to us about the birds and the bees, it was in vague generalities, and I really didn't comprehend what they were talking about. But um, after after that happened, um, I had a friend tell me, if you're not a virgin anymore, it doesn't matter if you go ahead and have sex. And so I did. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And so that's one of the reasons why um, I, I love to share uh, about sexual abstinence. Like me, I'm, I'm currently single, and um, I practice sexual abstinence in my life because um, that's that's a calling God placed on me um, a while back, and um, sexual abstinence and sharing about pro-life issues. And, you know, I, I love to go into schools and the public school systems and share with kids about sexual abstinence because, you know, it's so, it's, it's so much better than here's a condom, <clears throat> excuse me, here's a condom, learn how to use it. And, you know, one of the things that we, that we share is we, we have, um, you know, we can't really talk about God in schools, but, you know, we can tell them that, you know, there's a, when the guy and the girl come together in a sexual relationship, there's a bond that takes place. And, you know, when that relationship breaks up, there's, you know, it's like part of your heart is torn apart and forever a part of that other person. And we have a construction paper heart, and we tear off pieces of the heart to represent, you know, several broken relationships. <coughs> Excuse me. And, um, you know, and I'll, I'll hold out the heart and say, is this the kind of heart you want to give to your mate when you get married? And they're like, no, no, no. And, you know, there was one day I held out that heart, and I looked at it, and God said, that, Amy, that's your heart. Mm. Oh, Wow. And so I think that God can do anything. So that's when I began praying for him to heal my broken heart. And and then two weeks later, hold on. <coughs> I'm so sorry. That's okay. Um, hope you can edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> but um, two weeks later, I'm sitting in a traffic light, and um, I, I have a I'm, – I get a flashback of the abortion. I'm, you know, I'd ask God for forgiveness a million times for having the abortion, but that day at that light, God brought back to my remembrance lying there on that table and feeling them pulling that baby out of me, and I lost it. And so that's when I began. I went to um, talk with a friend of mine, and and she just, I, 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 she just held me in in her arms while I cried over the lo- over, over my baby. And she's the one who recommended that I go through the abortion recovery ministry. 
and um, and then I went on staff with them after I did that because, you know, when I when I saw my child, the development stages of my child, that and not only was I completely and totally broken, but I was really, really, really angry because one, I'd been lied to, two, it still happens on a daily basis. People are uh, women are aborting their babies right and left, right and left. And so I want to do everything I can to stop this process. And, you know, like with this book, Behind the Mask, I would love to see this book get into the hands of every teenager, every college-age student possible so they can understand. I mean, these these our kids these days, they want to know. They want to be educated. And... and I want them to know the effects of having an abortion. Because a couple of weeks ago, I was um, I had dinner after church with um, a friend of mine, and her um, college-age daughter was with us. She's a sophomore in college, and you know I asked her. I said, "Do you do do you know of any girls who've had abortions?" She said, "Oh yeah." I said, "Are they Christian?" She said, "Yes, ma'am." I said, "Well, why do you think that they have abortions?" She said, well, they don't want anything to interfere with them getting a degree, moving on with their career, and they just feel like, you know, a baby will interfere with that, and that's why they have an abortion. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's very sad, very sad. Our guest on Second Chances is Amy Lynn Nelson, the book entitled Behind the Mask. Uh, Amy, as someone is listening to this program, would like to learn uh, more about this book, the the ministries that you are called to work with and different things. Is there a website that uh, one could visit to learn more? Yes. Um, it is www.amybehindthemask.com, and it's all one word, Amy Behind the Mask. Um, you can get the book at any online bookstore. You can purchase the book on my website, and you can also um, send me an email. I will um, you know, just communicate with the author. I will get the email directly and would love to chat with you if you have any questions. Okay. Uh, what would you say to someone, uh, Amy, who is uh, contemplating an abortion or perhaps is in a very unhealthy sexual relationship and uh, they just really uh, are, are very, very confused at uh, where they're at in, in this moment? What would you want to say to those people right now if they were listening? First off, I want to tell you that you are loved you have worth. You do not have to put up with any kind of junk that somebody's dishing out and being ugly to you. Walk away. Stand up, walk away. You don't have to put up with it. And if you're in a situation where you are pregnant and you're contemplating having an abortion, please think twice. And and you know it it's not it's not just a mass of tissue it really is a baby and your baby already has a name and you know like you know god gave jesus a name before he was born he gave john a name before he was born you know he already knows your child's name all you have to do is pray for a name you know like me when i went through the abortion recovery group i prayed for my child's name and the name god gave me was caitlin marie and, you know, the name Caitlin means purity or pure one, and the name Marie means myrrh or living fragrance. And God has a name for your child, too. So I would encourage you to choose life and walk away from any kind of abusive situation that you're in. And if, you're, if, you, if you can, go talk with your parents. I wish I had done that because I would have never had an abortion. Obviously, Amy, there are people listening to this program today that are in those situations, and uh, really they would like to experience that freedom that took you years to accomplish. They, they're at that place right now in life where they really want to surrender, experience the f- uh, freedom, experience the forgiveness, and ultimately experience the salvation that only Jesus Christ can bring. And Amy, in our last uh, few moments together, would you be willing to pray right now for any listeners that are joining us that are in that very desperate place that have been seeking and searching for the Lord Jesus Christ? Absolutely. And I, I would also like to say, um, if, you, um, if you need an abortion recovery group, 
contact a local crisis pregnancy center and they either they will have one or they will be able to point you in the direction of one so make take the take the first baby step and make that call holy father we just come before you right now and i'm thanking you for all the people men and women who are listening to this program today i'm thanking father that you are bringing them out of the pit of darkness and you are setting them on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. You are going to bring forth healing into their hearts, their minds, their souls. And I am telling you, devil, you have no authority over them any longer. You are bound from operating against them and you have no authority over them. And I'm commanding you to flee back into the pits of hell where you belong. And Father, I thank you that you are sending your ministering spirits forth to minister to these beautiful people that you are going to Open up the doors for them to experience freedom, freedom like they've never known. And, you know, they may not realize that their current day struggles are attributed to an abortion they had when they were a teenager. Father, open up the eyes of their hearts and allow them to see you in your fullness, in your love, in your forgiveness, in your grace. We just praise you and thank you and love you. And, Father, thank you so much for Greg and his ministry to all of his listeners. Thank you for blessing him and his radio program, Advantage Radio. Thank you for loving him and blessing him. In the name of Jesus, amen. Our guest on Second Chances today has been Amy Lynn Nelson, Behind the Mask. And, Amy, one more time for those that are uh, looking for uh, more information, learning about uh, the things that you're involved in, and uh, perhaps even being pointed in the direction of a of a good uh, group. Uh, what's the website they could visit? It is www.amybehindthemask.com. And we want to thank you, Amy, for sharing. And uh, we believe that uh, what you've put in this book and what you share uh, by visiting here on the radio and other places uh, certainly is going to be a big help to uh, other women that have uh, uh, been where or going uh, where you've been. So we want to thank you very much, Amy, for, for joining us. Thank you, Craig, for having me on your show. Tune in next week for more Second Chances right here from Advantage Radio Ministries here on Lift FM.